some of that. All right, we're recording. Uh, Mandy, if you don't mind making that announcement before you, thank you. I will, I will. Okay, um, so we, let's see. Okay. Are we missing Shalini? Uh, we are, but I'll I'll make note of that when I open and all. Okay, so um, it is. I'll make that announcement, Athena, as part of my opening spiel. So it is four thirty one p.m. and seeing a quorum of the committee present, I am calling this community resources committee of the town council to order at. 4, at 4.31 p.m. I just said that. Um, this meeting is being recorded and pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 22, 2022. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. At this time, I'm going to call the roll to make sure that everyone can hear us and we can hear everyone else. I'm going to start with the member that is absent, and that is Shalini Balmil, and she will not be attending today. So with that, Pat? Present. Uh, Mandy is present. Pam? Present. And Jennifer? Present. Thank you. Um, we've done all that, which means we do not have any public here. Oh, Kelly. Yes. Oh, Hi that's there. the other thing. Hold on. Before I want to say to the audience um, and attendees that we have a new minute taker. So that is Kelly. And so Kelly may have a couple of questions today and we'll be dealing with them as they pop up. Kelly, yes. My only question so far is uh, if you could spell the name of the council member who is not present. Excellent. That is Shalini is her first name, S-H-A-L-I-N-I. -I, mm -hmm. And Balmiln is hyphenated, B-A, B is in boy, yep. A-H-L, and then the hyphen, and mm -hmm. then Milne, M-I-L-N-E. Wonderful. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Kelly. And um, we're going to move through our agenda. Um, so no public hearings today. Um, we have on the agenda two action items. Um, we're going to start with associate member vacancies, but there's really nothing on the agenda for that. I did, left that there in case we needed to discuss anything. Um, we'll, we'll make announcements, and if the committee wants to discuss, we'll discuss. Um, everything is posted for interviews for December 20th, 2022 at 10 a.m. Um, by, by Zoom. Everyone should have gotten their invitations. The candidates should have gotten their invitations. All the SOIs are up and the names are in the agenda. We have three candidates for three spots. Um, so I guess I have it on here in case the committee would like to discuss or make any other votes regarding sufficiency of applicant pool, because I believe when we originally voted that, I said we would come back and wait till we saw the SO, what SOIs were submitted. Um, but three applicants and three up to three vacancies to fill. And we're not required to fill all three. That is correct. Okay. I haven't looked at who's applied yet. So I have, I, I know the names because I had to do the agenda. I have not read the SOIs either. I did count the words because I always have to count the words to make sure they comply. You're mean. It's in the rules. <laughs> And I actually had to do one word count this year instead of like relying on the electronics because one was submitted by paper. So I actually did count the words. I'm not seeing any hands regarding or any comments regarding wanting to revisit revisit the sufficiency of the pool. Um, oh, Pam. Well, I'm uh, obviously this is this is an. Um... A, a not a great position to be in to have only three candidates and three positions. Um, I think last time we had four candidates and three positions and it made us very nervous that there were so few choices kind of a thing. So, you know, we're in, in uh, a very similar situation. Um, I think it's pretty indicative that a lot of people, uh, one person who stepped back, who was actually, you know, in the pool, was was interested, um, wrote back to me and just said, you know, there are things going on in life that I just don't think I 
uh, need to exacerbate by by adding meetings and and another kind of schedule to my life. So people are busy, and um, I I just have to say I, I really appreciate that people are interested in these committees. Um, whatever we can do to facilitate that is is good. Anyway, it's it is it is disappointing, especially with a second round that that um, you know. What or, kind of Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I thought you were done, Pam. I'm Pam sorry. Thing. Um, what kind of how long a delay would it be if we tried to get more people? It makes me nervous because we've had such a hard time. So it was hard to find an interview time right now. Um, no, I mean, how no, like, well, how. how Let's just say months, this two weeks, you know, I don't know. This vacancy was posted in July. Okay. Right. <laughs> and okay. and this is where we are after waiting. I, I think the last time we voted, which was mid-November, I think it was three meetings ago, um, Pam, where mm -hmm. we voted sufficiency with yeah. a goal of hoping more people and trying to announce more people and all and nothing came right mm -hmm. and so we've been sitting sort of in this position since July I would yeah. say right mm -hmm. we kept pushing off let's go out let's make people known in August and September and October I don't think and I don't think we've received a new SOI since late July um in calf CAF, sorry, yes, CAF. <laughs> got the, oh, and CAF for Kelly's um, benefit is a community activity form and SOI is statement of interest. Thank you very <laughs> much. Why would you know that? <laughs> I mean, I think Z, there's something about the ZBA description is a little, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. I don't think it's what it is, but it's a little intimidating. I know a couple of people I re reached out to just thought they weren't qualified or. You know. Well, I would I would like to help Steve judge the chair, you know, at least have a full compliment. It sounds like the associate member that was brought on last July has actually been pretty busy, which I mean, so that surprised me, but you know, maybe if there were a few more associate members, yeah. they could divvy up the work a little bit so that the associate member wouldn't actually feel like a full member um, um, or wouldn't need to be acting as a full member. Yeah. Good point. Good point. I think there was one meeting they didn't have a quorum. Mm. So. Any other comments on the sufficiency? I will put these notes into a report. Um, so that so that we can let the council know we did revisit this issue after we knew the total pool too. Um, so, and then make the comments about we got to figure something out, <laughs> and it's not our committee's the only role; it, it's the whole council's duty to figure something out. Okay, um, with that, I'm going to move on to the second action item. Our only other, well. We have the major business for today, I would say. <laughs> it's not our only other. Um, and this is the residential rental bylaw. Um, I apologize. We put I put new drafts of the bylaw and the regulations into the packet on Tuesday night. I am sorry that they were so late. I'm going to explain why they were and why there were so many changes. Um, and, and then we can discuss everything. So after last meeting, when we were trying to discuss the regulations um, in general concept, I realized that if we had a hope of getting this done in a reasonable amount of time, and I took the questions from Shalini at the end about what else can we do on our agenda besides just this as part of, let's not spend the next six months on just this too, um, that, a potentially another approach to regulations needed done. And so I contacted Pam on my own, um, who's the vice chair and also someone who's been very interested in the language, the, the, lang the specific language instead of um, the concepts around the language. And Pam and I got together on Tuesday morning and just hashed out some of it. 
That's why there is a full track changes and a clean version um, to try and talk through some of what this committee has been discussing and come up with some language um, to potentially move our conversations forward and the progress this committee is making. And that's not to say we have made tremendous progress. I will say that this is nothing about the committee not making progress to move it forward even farther. Um, one of the big things that will be noticed in these drafts and Pam can, and I'm going to give time for Pam to talk about anything we did too. Um, you know, after that discussion, we worked through things, everything's tracked because we're not a subcommittee and all I made the final decisions for what goes into today's packet, right? That's everything's always up for grabs, right? And everything's always up for discussion. But one of the biggest things that might have concerned people is there was a lot of removal of um, the point system and the problem property designation from these drafts. Um, what we discussed and what um, sort of these new drafts propose, which is worth discussing today, is um, to use the nuisance house bylaw as part of sort of how a rental registration permit is deemed suspendable or not. So use things already in place, use our code enforcement that's already in place. So you've saw some stuff regarding what the checklist might look like really got pared down. Um, use the codes that are already in place use the bylaws that are already in place. And yes, this committee has already talked about the nuisance house bylaw and said, we need to rewrite it. It needs revisited, right? And so um, using that revisiting to say, let's figure out what a nuisance house is. And then if it makes it, if a house that is a rental is deemed a nuisance house at some point under that bylaw, well, that has ramifications under the rental permit bylaw. Um, there will not be a draft of the nuisance house bylaw until the new year. Too much to do in one day. <laughs> yeah. but, but it's a recognition also that part of the package that we would send to the council with our recommendations would include the nuisance house bylaw revisions. So it's not an intent to say, oh, we need to revise that later, but we're going to work it into this one. And in six months, we'll have a revision to that. There, I intend to have a draft revision of that to discuss in January so that the package that we would send to the council would include a rental registration bylaw, rental registration regulations, fee structures and fee schedule for the rental registration bylaw and a nuisance house bylaw, either revision or it, it probably would end up being repeal and replace, right? It would be all four now instead of just three. We started with one, now we're up to four. Um, so that's one of the biggest changes, but I wanted to address that right of way because I figured people would have some concern seeing so much do. Um, Pam, and then I'll go to what some of the other changes are. Yeah, I was going to say, so in general, the basic the basic separation of these um, into of the material that's been put together over the past months is has been pulled apart into kind of two components. So the the bylaws, sort of the rules and regulations, and then excuse me, <laughs> the the rules, and then the second piece is the regulations, and that's where we um, we can reference things like um, what do the checklists for safety and health security, et cetera, um, what, what do those checklists look like? So it's sort of the, the nuts and bolts of, um, of, of action items. I'm not expressing this very well, but it's sort of the details, uh, the actual procedures, what's going to be required on a form. All of that is pulled out away from the bylaw, which can be a little clearer. It can just be sort of the rules of the road. Um, so people reading it will understand much more quickly um, what they have to deal with, what the picture is that they're dealing with if they are to go to rent or to become a, a landlord or something like that. So it, it sort of cleaned it up into two pots of information. And, and Pam, you segued directly into what my other point was going to be, which is you'll see a lot of stuff got deleted from one and moved to another. 
like the language was moved wholesale from one from say the bylaw to the reg or from the reg to the bylaw we saw when we took this deep dive on tuesday morning that in some sections particularly i think it was um regarding inspection procedure or something there were a couple sections where the regs were nearly i like that had been pulled directly from the bylaw and almost nothing else was added um into the regs and so it, it sort of the thinking was well if you're not adding any content into the regs and you're just copying it over delete it from the regs and put it all in the bylaw so so there looks like there's a lot of changes um to some stuff but some of it was just recognizing it doesn't need repeated in both places pick one um so I'll take general questions and all, and then I think we're gonna we're gonna start with the regulations and then move back to the bylaw and see what we get through. <laughs> but general questions first, and any concerns or anything like that, anything Pam and I can answer before we delve into language. Pat, a uh, quick question and a comment: uh, uh, What kind of inspection checklists exist now in Amherst? What does John? or anyone inspecting use now and uh, do you have a sense of that because if it could be either expanded or um simply added that would save some time that's one question and then my comment is it's really nice to see you and pam working closely together i mean you've been doing it for a while but it feels really good thank you both thanks um so I can't fully answer that question, Pat. In terms of rental registration, there is no checklist anymore. The back of the application says, sign here that your rental complies with the state building code. And then it, and zoning bylaws, Pat, Pam's got a copy of it probably right in front of her, but it's like, it sign here and certify that it complies with these three things. Here's links to those three things. And it literally links to the CMR that's like 20 pages long. Yeah. Um, and all you're doing is certifying that. So there's no like, quick reference of even a summary of the CMR. Um, what I can't answer is, is there, when a complaint is filed, does John or Rob have a checklist they go in with for their inspections? Because right. I, I haven't asked, asked that question. I, we can, we can certainly ask it. And I'm, I'm watching to make sure Rob is supposed to be joining us. So when, when he does, um, you know, we can try and get him to answer that question. And if not, I'll, I'll send that question over to him. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer. Unmute. Um, yeah, I thought it was much easier to read. You know, just so, and actually when I, yeah, I started reading it, I was like, oh, this is much easier to read. Maybe I'm just familiar with it, but I think it makes much more sense. Um, and then, like when you refer to the CMR, will we get to see all this? And uh, maybe it could be in the next hmm. package, just so we just see all the components. And so, I just want to be clear. So, the nuisance house bylaw—that's in the zoning bylaw. No, no, it's a general bylaw. General bylaw. So, it would be the inspectors that would link the two. So if you have a violation under the nuisance house bylaw, that would be recorded. So if you go to renew a permit, they'll know that that landlord has. So right now, we, oh, I'll let Pam respond to that. Yeah. <laughs> the answer, the, I think the short answer needs to be yes, because they are the only ones that are that are responding to the complaints and, and registering something. The records, I think, are probably good in their minds, but they're not enabling us to, um, they're not enabling us to associate it with, with any particular building in, in terms of permit. Um, I, I had read the, and highlighted the nuisance bylaw a while ago. And what struck me is that it says, you know, here's the definition of a nuisance house and there, and there are, you know, these little definitions, but it never says, if you are deemed a nuisance house, this is what happens to you. It's just like, there's nothing, there's no ramification of being a nuisance house. It's just that you get called one. Like, okay. Isn't I there a fine? I thought there was a fine connected. 
there may be a fine, but it, again, it, it's not like, it, it's not clear as, is it one violation, is it two, is it three, is it five? So I think, I think this is a really good opportunity to strengthen and, or just clean it up make, and make sense out of it. Any other general questions before we move to specific language? Pam. How, do you, how are you planning to do this? Do you want to just go like line by line? Um, basically, but I was going to do it section by section or mini section by, you know, but yeah. I would like to remind people in the audience that these documents we're going to be talking about are in our CRC meeting packet and the ones that they ought to look at are labeled um, 3.B regulations for general bylaw, 3.50 residential room property, blah, 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 clean. So you just go in and look for the clean ones. So that's that's what we're talking about. Yeah. And and I'm sorry that that most of us haven't really had much chance to look at them just because they got put in so recently. Yeah, I, I never like to go that late, but it's just when Pam and I could get together. So um, we'll obviously we'll have plenty of time to do these other times too. But um, oh, Athena, can you enable screen sharing? And we're going to put them on the screen so that anyone watching can also see what we're talking about um, once we get it enabled. Is Athena around? I know Athena is juggling. Oh. Athena is juggling multiple meetings right now, um, and she is our only host. So. Oh, okay. I was going to say, is Kelly a co-host? No. Um, give me a second. Let me try this again. We'll give her a second. <laughs> um, but we're going to start with the application requirements. And 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 one of the things um, that Pam and I flagged for future discussion, we've had some discussions on this, and we might want to postpone it until we can get the ECAC members in here or not. But we flagged for future discussion the energy efficiency information that um, that ECAC has asked us to uh, ask about in applications. Um, so we'll treat that section, which is 1H of section A. We'll, we'll look at the rest of section 1A1 um, one before we look at section H. Um, so, Kelly. The uh, group that you just mentioned, was it the AC? The ECAC, which is our Energy and Climate Action Committee. Great, thank you. Mandy, where are we starting? Um, regulations and the very first line, once I can get, I, I'm gonna keep trying screen sharing. I texted Athena to ask Athena to do so. Um, to I any, have it up on my own screen, but but it, so we'll we'll start, and I'll keep checking the screen sharing capabilities, and as soon as we get it, um, we'll put it on the screen. Um, but it is in the packet, so that we can all go to the packet to look. But I will every thirty seconds or so click the screen share button to see if um, we we've gotten it there um, from juggling many things and we're still unused to screen sharing not being enabled automatically um, for these. So we're going to start with regulations, clean draft, application requirements, section 1A to G is what we're starting with. Um, there is only a section 1, so we can probably redo the numbering so there isn't just a no section 2. But um, any questions, comments, requests for changes to sections A to G? 
Pam. I, I would like to just note that um, I think it's pretty apparent that this, this Section A application requirements really needs to reflect what our uh, registration form asks for. Why would we ask for it in a form and not here on the list? So at some point, we probably um, will also end up having to adjust the application form. Um, so I just want to make sure everybody was aware of that in that and because of that on the application form there is a, a section called what is your property type and it gives examples of single family duplex um apartment etc and it, and so we are we obviously need to ask that question as well and so you're looking to add a line um Probably yeah. between B and C or between A and B, probably. In terms of the order on the application form, it's it's either a a new A1 or or B or B1, but it really needs to go in there. It's the one, it's the second line on the form and it just says property type, example, single family, two family, et cetera. And so we would we would just need to add that in. Yep. Okay. I will make that note on my document. Um, anything else until we get to energy efficiency information? Pam. Um, A1C asks for the total number of bedrooms and bathrooms in each dwelling unit to be rented. And I think, um, what is difficult is that we're so far talking about a permit per property and the property could have 15 buildings on it. Um, at, in some shape or form, we need to know like building one has four two bedrooms or three three bedrooms so that we have a count by building. It could already be on the property card, um, but it needs to, that needs to get documented in some way. Yeah, I mean, the current application asks for total number of bedrooms and bathrooms, and it's unclear whether it's on the property. Like, if it's a boulders, is it? Do they put like a hundred and well, it'd be like three hundred, right? Like, or do they list each one separately? And so, I think this needs to be tagged for conversation with what would a form look like on how we do this. Um, even for both C and D, the number of occupants, right? Um, because because right now they're in each dwelling unit. And so when you get a Boulders or a Puffton or a South Point, um, you know, or a townhouse, what does that application look like if they have to list every single unit separately <laughs> and, and numbers? Right. Now, maybe after the first year of this, they've got their system, right? But but I'm very cognizant of if something like this is on the property card, see, I, I wonder, is that on the property card? And if it's on the property card, does it need to be asked in an application? Um, and so I think I'd want to hear from Rob at some point um, what he thinks about some of these questions. Mm -hmm. We may, we may have some folks in the audience who also could respond to that kind of a question. Yeah. Okay, Jennifer. Yeah, or I don't know if this is helpful to have. It, it could say, if you're a puffed in, you know, how many one bedroom, two bedroom, you don't have to list them individually. Mm -hmm. One more comment. Yep. Um, in item G, which is requirement requirements for person in charge contact information, it says contact. Uh, I think we need a line name. <laughs> we need wait, a wait. name, and that's not being asked for here. Um, so as well as contact address. Yeah, I'm gonna. Gonna... I mean, that must be the one. I have G. Whether the owner resides in the property. 
Oh, am I looking at the wrong version? I, I probably am. No, uh, um, once we add that line, Pam, then the numbers, the numbering goes up. Um, no, I so wanna, it was originally G in the draft, Jennifer. Is this page five or am I in the total? No, league? we're on page one of the regulations. Of uh, just the regulations, right? Just Not the regulations. The, okay, because I, I just found that out a little bit before this, so. <laughs> yeah, sorry, no, we're just talking about the regulations right now. I was going to refer us back to the bylaw for that question, Pam, because the bylaw, uh, what we did with this one with the application is we removed um, the a, a lot of information from the bylaw and moved it to the regulations and that bylaw still requires the names, contact mailing addresses, valid telephone numbers, and valid email addresses for persons in charge. Um, and so oh, this think. was an attempt to define, we removed those definitions of what a con valid contact and valid telephone number means, what a valid mailing address means and what a valid email address means. And so maybe it's worth putting it back into the bylaw if it gets confusing here. Um, we kept in the bylaw name, mailing address, telephone number, email address of the owners, that same information for a person in charge, um, short-term rentals, some information if it's going to be a short-term rental, and then D was the catch-all and anything else in the regs. Um, with the goal of saying what should never change what should we always ask for and not leave up to the board of license commissioners to be able to modify and we felt person in charge owner and for short-term rentals um those two items that were in there should stay in the bylaw and then everything else could go into the regs so they this is one where they do kind of work intermixed with each other um so we're on page one of the regs with that um thoughts pam on or thoughts from the committee on whether we would move those g one two and three back into the bylaw or well so looking at the bylaw and there is a definition called person person in charge and it describes what that person is. Um, it describes owner, it just, you know, so um, I think this, this section is trying to reflect what is on the application. So right. it, it's not, um, it doesn't need to be overly complicated. It just, I think we end up having a form and then we have the same information spelled out in words um in the in the regulations so at some point we um and that's pretty clear on the on the application form it says property agent and ad, agent's address agent's phone number agent's email address so that's everything that's being asked for in the regulation um but it does it does have the word name it does say name of which is i think is pretty important so for now, I, I, I'm happy having it right here in, in the regulations. Okay. Anything else until we move to energy efficiency information? We're gonna move to this, um, energy efficiency information. And I'm just gonna summarize where Pam, we left it in, obviously, we've had a discussion before on whether to put it in or not. We've generally just thrown everything in that EC, the committee asked for, ECAC asked for. Um, my concern, which is why I brought it up for potential discussion, is if you look at this list, some of it, I think, is on a property card already. So it goes back to, do we need to have it on this application if it's already on a property card, number one? But number two is, I don't know how easy it is to actually obtain some of this information. And what is our goal with the application form? Is it something, 
were okay with landlords needing four or five hours or days to complete to come up with some of this information? Or is it something that we want it to not be daunting to complete? And I read some of this energy and efficiency information that ECAC has asked us to put into these regs and bylaws as requesting. And if I wanted to rent out an ADU, I'd be I don't know what I'd do with some of this, right? You know, especially depending on who's paying the utilities. You know, if I was as a landlord paying some of the utilities, maybe it wouldn't be so hard. But if I'm not paying the utilities, if the utilities are getting paid by the tenant, how do I get some of this information? It might not even be available to me. Um, and so I don't know what the right answer myself is. Um, but I wonder if it's going beyond what we want a residential rental permitting bylaw to be. And we can have that discussion now, or if the committee would prefer that discussion happen with um, Steve Roof and Stephanie Ciccarello here, we can postpone it to a time where we can get them here. Um, I think I would like both things without, I feel like, what are the things that we are requiring of any home. I mean, what do we have a legal right to require? Um, I don't have to uh, make my home energy efficient. I own it, I'm not renting it. I, I don't have to do anything to it. So to me, what are the most essential things that should be in there? And these regulations, this, the regulations need not to be daunting and they need to be able to uh, be looked at carefully. Does it really matter in terms of regulation whether there is an electric charging station near my uh, at my house, um, even if I'm going to rent it? Um, and maybe it does. I just you know so I feel like I want to hear from Stephanie uh, and Steve or somebody else, but. Um, I think that these need to be condensed and slimmed down to what is essential. Pam? Uh, in response to Pat, I, I, I agree with that. Um, I think there are a couple things trying to go on. And one is that um, certainly across town, um, people that are trying to you know improve our, our climate our efficiency, et cetera, et cetera, need, need the information, they need data. You know, how is Amherst doing? How have we, you know, how close are we to our meeting our climate goals? And in in some sense, if if there were certain questions to say, you know, do you have do you have an EV charging station on your property? Do you have any solar panels on your property? If yes, you know, how many kilowatts or what size thing? So that we can start <clears throat> start to um, sort of accrue a little bit of information about how we're doing. The thing that struck me about asking these kinds of questions is that um, I don't know. I don't know actually what kind of a. I don't know if we have a database for property cards, and that's in the real sense of, you know, is this a a, a queryable database where I can go say how many how many EV stations do we have on rental properties and you query the system and it can tell you that. I don't get a sense that our property cards are truly databases. And so the only way to find that information is literally to go card by card or you know file by file. So um, I think that's a good question for Rob and town staff is, you know, can we can we find if if we ask for this information, can we even find it if someone asks us about it? So that's where I'm thinking is who who needs the information and and is it uh, retrievable? It, yeah. Um, Jennifer. Oh wait. Kelly. Just really quickly, could I get last names for Stephanie and Steve and their affiliations? Yes. So Steve Roof, R-O-F, he is the liaison 
from the Energy and Climate Action Committee to our committee. Okay. Um, and Stephanie's last name is Chicarello, and I always try, I, I'm trying to spell it right, C-I-C-C-A-R-E-L-L-O. Okay. Um, and she is our Director of Sustainability. All right. And we now have Rob on the call. I just noticed you, Rob. So if you've been here for a while, thank you. But um, Rob Mora is our, um, he is our building commissioner. Great. And he's the Rob we've been referencing throughout this meeting. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Jennifer. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, so I agree with, you know, with what Pat is saying that, you know, a, somebody who is renting out a house shouldn't have a greater burden than someone living in a house uh, for like energy efficiency necessarily. But if um, we might have covered this before, if you're renting out a property and the tenant is paying the utility bill, then is there an incentive to be energy efficient on the part of the homeowner? And we were trying to create some incentives. Right, right. I understand that. Yeah. But I, uh, and there's information. Well, do, I don't know how we balance that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought you were done. Yeah, yeah. No, go. Well, I'm trying to figure out, you know, there's information on here that's important for a tenant. Who's responsible for the energy bills is an important, we need to know that. And the annual costs uh, of heating and cooling, I think that's important for tenants to know. Um, but I, I'm, I'm sitting here, do, do we want our, uh, this is all important information and I support energy efficiency. I mean, I, and I, but I'm trying to understand why do we have such, are, are we gathering the data for other committees through, uh, is the town gathering that information through our regulations? These aren't regulations, these are questions um, mostly. Um, that's a good point. Yeah. So, you know, I somehow rather, I don't know, it just feels odd to me or too dense or something. I don't know. And I, it's, yeah. And, and to piggyback on that, and then I'm going to ask Rob a couple questions to catch you up, Rob. We're working on the regulations for general bylaw that are in there, and we're working from the clean version right now, um, and we're working on through it. And we have a couple of questions that came up before you joined us, but I wanted to respond to Pat before I pose them to you, which is, um, you know, is, is some of this information something that we need to require to give tenants the right information, or is it something that tenants should be responsible for finding out on their own? Um, and would would the application itself help them get that information, right? That goes back to sort of Pam's queryable database. What would we do with the information if we have it? Would it just be internally accessible or externally accessible? And I'm just going to mention one. The others it, it may be hard for tenants to obtain the information, but who's responsible for the utilities bills should be something a tenant knows before they sign a contract, right? right. <laughs> right. You know? yeah. um, but having you know, a sense of what the, those costs but, are, are important for a tenant to know in advance so they have, they right. can make a decision that fits their budget. Right. And so maybe we don't have to ask the question who's responsible for the utility bills but may because that should be obvious based on whatever their negotiation is but you know when i've tried to find utility bill information before i've purchased a house or when i've rented it's really hard to find because you know the utilities aren't always willing to give you that information you might not know particularly when i have oil heat I don't know which company the com the prior tenant or owner even used. So, and they might have used different ones, right? So it might not be even accessible when trying to access it. Unlike water, where you can go on and see the bill for every property um, already accessible. The water and sewer usage is already on attached to property cards. Um, so if you search for the property, you can see those usages. So um, 
maybe looking at some of the questions like that might also be helpful. But Rob, a couple questions that came up. The first one was about inspection checklists. We know for residential rental bylaw purposes, there isn't an actual checklist anymore. But when an inspector goes in based on a complaint or when you go in to inspect, I think you've said you have to inspect the common areas of the apartment complexes on a yearly basis, or I think some of the fraternities get inspected on a yearly basis on something else. Um, do you have a checklist that you use or is it just sort of all in your head? <laughs> It's actually a combination, and it'll vary depending on the type of building that it is. Um, and and each inspector, you know, I know, um, for example, the fire inspector and the building inspector that uh, do common inspections together, they have checklists built into their iPad, you know, that they go through and electronically, uh, you know, go through their process. Uh, that's also used for fraternities and sororities by the inspectors as a joint team. Um, there's, when it's a complaint though, it's handled a little bit differently because it's generally a health, uh, a process through the health codes. And that has a document that is used as a checklist. It's, it's several pages and identifies every, you know, system and component throughout the dwelling unit that the inspector uses and, uh, includes the, the code reference for the issue and then uh, uses that as the report to send off to the owner of the property. So it's really a mix of things and the, the format is different depending on the type of inspection or which code it's based on. Thanks for that. Any follow-ups on that right now before we go back to applications? seen none we're going to get back to inspection checklists later on hopefully in this meeting so we'll have time then too the next one was about um we were talking about energy efficiency information and some of this other stuff and oh, Pam, Pam, yeah excuse me um well because rob has joined us um we were we were asking i was asking uh if he could describe if we actually have databases on properties, um, I don't know that a property card or the file for a property card is a, um, a queryable database or is it sort of a static thing that you go in and just fill in in some block. The reason I'm asking is what information are we asking for? Is it something that could then be searched you know, and, and you could search and query the database to actually use the information that we're asking for. What is our system? <laughs> so our our system, well, I'll, let me start with what our new system is and what we've started using this year with our new permitting program, because that probably will answer your question about how can we use this, this information. Um, anything that's plugged in to the application or asked through the application process is reportable. So, you know, so I can, um, I can ask, uh, staff to generate a report on the number of bedrooms in two to five unit properties, because that's something we ask for through the application process. So as long as we build it into the, the application as a question that has to be completed, we can report on that information. I think what we want to be able to do ourselves that we haven't figured out quite yet is how to display some of that information mm -hmm. uh, on the website. So in the past, uh, under the old system, uh, we were able to take the permit displayed on the GIS and the mapping system under, under the property address and any activity that was you know, related to code enforcement or permitting. We, we've temporarily lost that ability, so we need to work uh, with IT on how to do that. Um, you know, the, the systems weren't compatible uh, for security purposes to, to have that continue, uh, but you know, IT knows it's of great interest for us to have that available on the website. Uh, but anything we collect, we can we can easily access and do something with it. 
uh, if needed. Okay. Great, thank you. That's very. Helpful. I'm going to follow up, but but for now, to be clear, that's internal access, not external access. Right. That's that's right. Okay, but hopefully, at some point, there will be external access. <laughs> And, and you know, just to clarify that, you know, for because we use this more for the building permit application process, there there is public access to the building permits. There there's access by the users uh, who are applying or are uh, given permissions to see the back and forth um, discussion that happens between inspectors and applicant or contractors and so on. Uh, that houses all, a lot of documents, all the attachments that would normally be part of a, a permit application. And that's the same for a rental permit. So you get your parking plan and that's about it. You know, so there just isn't a lot of that type of information, but the system is capable of, of that as well. So, you know, one thought is, can we generate or uh, easily generate a report so that we're not making the permits so lengthy? You know, we want to have some information on the permit that's important, but do we need to list the year of the last renovation? Uh, but maybe there's a report that could be generated fairly exactly. easy and that be an attached document that gets put into that, that system. So we're trying to figure out how to use the system we have for that type of purpose to display more information about the property. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions on the application section, section A of the regulations right now or the the I could put up, but we're going to stay on regulations. The equivalent section in the bylaw, which was application, um, in the bylaw, we kind of summarized what's in the bylaw right now on that, and that's section G in the application in the bylaw draft. Um, I think it will get confusing if we try to shuttle yeah. back and forth. We'll come back to the bylaw. You're absolutely right, Pam. Thank it you. Excuse me. <laughs> I it will confuse me. <laughs> You're absolutely right. <laughs> okay, we're moving on then to inspection requirements. Um, this is one of the sections that really changed. Can I just ask something? Is this the document that's in the public file? Yes. Okay. It should be. It has a different date. Okay. It should be. because It's I, there. I sent it to Athena to post these four, and Athena said they were posted. It should say revision two. So what I have is revision nine. Oh, that's the bylaws. Okay. But when I look in the file under today's meeting, I'm not seeing it. Okay. It's in never mind. I don't want to take it any time. It should be a regulations revision two, although the revision two might be off the thing. It should start three B regulations. Okay, it does. I'll, I'll follow this that's on the screen. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep it on the screen okay. now that I can. And if I'll check if it's not in there, we'll get it in there. It's definitely in SharePoint because I've put it in. Yeah, it SharePoint. is. Okay. Um, but I did I, request Athena put it online. Um, I, I can double check, but I, I usually don't lie about the, those things. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it, it could have been missed, is all I'm saying, because it I could have been lots missed. of documents. So <laughs> no disparaging. Remark. Yeah, yeah, no, or I mean, just, <laughs> you know, does a fantastic job. Like I'm seeing there. Okay. I would blame myself before I blame Athena for not checking to make sure that it was done. <laughs> that, that, that it, it you know, I, I, I don't always check because I trust Athena so much. And so that's on me for, um, yeah, no, I have to get in the up. habit of going to SharePoint. I still go onto the public file, yeah. but that's okay. It, oh. is, it is in SharePoint. Yeah. I, I don't usually check that, but I need to do that. Okay. Okay. So this section on inspection requirements had a bunch of changes, but not a lot of substantive, I think, Pam. I think it was just a lot of moving stuff around um, between moving stuff out of bylaw and into regulations, um, but not much substantively changed and fixing up the organization. We had like two sections that talked about five-year inspections. Now they're both under the same section, um, things like that. Um, you know, and so we'll start first with the frequency schedule. Not all of it is on the page right now, I don't believe, um, because there's, 
yeah, we're missing just those two and three down below under annual or other periodic. And so, oh, yeah. so I'll page down to that eventually, but basically it remains the same as we've been talking about, which is the goal is a three-year inspection requirement. Basically, Rob's department gets into every rental unit at least once every three years. We've put, there's been in the, in all the drafts, a, a ability to lengthen that to five years for two reasons. The first is long-term tenants um, that have occupied the same dwelling unit for five or more years. Um, and then the second one is um, one we've talked about where there aren't violations, the inspections aren't finding any, and the property's not having complaints for general bylaw violations. Um, and so that has been moved into just cleared up and sort of what that means. So sort of that that carrot of for landlords and tenants, you know, if you're keeping your house and your rental unit, um, the property in good condition and compliant with building code, and there aren't noise complaints and nuisance complaints and things like that littering, we can talk about which bylaw violations are in there, um, then you don't have to have that inspection even every three years. So those are the two sort of length inspections that, that have been in this for a while. And then there's the annual or periodic section, um, which is the shortening part, right? Sort of this, the other side of that, which is if there are um, multiple building code violations. Um, in, and, and this is where we might have to revise the language, but, but inspection violations, if you've had a lot of them, well, then we're giving the building commissioner the option of going in more than once every three years um, is the first one. The second one is if you, this is where it, we've moved to that nuisance house. If the property makes it to a nuisance house designation under the bylaw, and as as I said, we'll know then. Um, and if that's within the past three years where you'd normally have one inspection, well, then now you're can be made to be inspected more than once, more than frequently than every three years. And then the third one is. Um, and this gets down to number of units inspected. The goal is um, to get into every dwelling unit in a reasonable amount of time too. So for buildings that have lots of dwelling units where we're saying the building commissioners, the inspections, the and those, those permit inspections don't have to inspect all 100 or 200 units in one go. The goal is to get into every single one of those units over a four year period. Um, and so that's sort of the third one. And because you want to get into the units in a four year period, you might have to inspect the property more frequently than every three years. So that's sort of the newish one that wasn't in the regulations prior to Tuesday. So that's sort of the new one for this one. Um, thoughts from anyone including rob on this structure and the goal of all of this and the five-year side and the one-year side including any language change that might be needed for this and then the green sections um i didn't get all the green ones the green is sort of those decision points um you know three or more building fire or sanitary code that might be three or more in those are things that need to be decided. Pam. Yeah, um, Mandy, you actually used the wording um, properties, uh, the compliant, I like the word compliant properties would be would be inspected every five years, five years. Uh, and you actually use the word at least every five years. And so I would love to say in that very first paragraph, A, B1A, last sentence it says therefore all properties shall be inspected no less than every five years when i when i see no less than i just have to sit there and think wait a minute what does that mean i would love to use the words at least every five years for people like me who are easily confused it's just much clearer
And I think this is just this section because it applies to B2, B1B. Yeah. Yeah. The way that's worded. Another another element that we I think got lost in the translation here is that we had a, a phrase about um, frequency of inspection for uh, new new units. And so if they've just had a, a certificate of occupancy within the last three years, they don't need to be inspected. So um, that would probably want to be. That's in the bylaw under exempted inspection. I think we kept exemptions in the bylaw. This is where sometimes you have to go back and forth. Rob, are you seeing anything you want to comment on? Uh, I'm wondering in D1, just to figure out a way to make it clearer um, that the three or more violations really is about um, you know, being called to the property or visiting the property for some reason three or more times, uh, just because that I don't want it to be interpreted as, you, you know, we conduct our inspection and it's very likely there could be a, a list of eight or 10 things that are part of that inspection, uh, that that's one, one inspection visit. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly how to word that, but uh, might want to think about that one a little bit more just to make sure we're clear about that. Yeah, it is three. So three or more, um, somewhere in the bylaw, we refer to orders, notice of violation and order to remedy. Would something like three or more notices of, vi separate notices of violation. I assume when you issue a notice of violation, it might have 20 different violations on it. Right, and that, 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 would, that would take care of it. That's what I would mean, yes. Okay. <clears throat> And would three be reasonable? Like, is that a number you're comfortable with? Or, you know, what would you, where would you want to get to in terms of being able to say, we want to be in here more than every three years? I actually, um, I would probably like, I would prefer that to be, um, well, I guess I what I would like is the ability to set a follow-up inspection schedule uh, almost at any time, mm. um, because you know it's one thing to you know be out there and dealing with a, a, a leaky faucet, and and you know the more severe cases that are the ones that I've been most concerned about having the ability to. Uh, to put into some sort of follow-up inspection program. Uh, so, you know, maybe some language about, you know, for severe violations, you know, as deemed by the, the, the code official, um, you know, additional inspections may be, may be required, you know, some, something like that, that we can put in somewhere just to have that ability. It's very rare, but there's, you know, there's there's the the dozen properties or so that we 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 know about that fall into that category that I would would like to be able to do that and as we inspect properties it's, it's very likely that there could be more added to a list like that. Does this section here about failed inspections um, cover it or like could we reference that? It requires you to have been in and inspected at least once, right? I think I think we're um, gonna need time to actually digest. Yeah, yeah I <laughs> forgot. I, yeah, I forgot about this section. Um, I'm looking for the language about setting the inspection. And, um, and 
Mandy, I would, yep, I would, Pam, I would, I'll make a note to, to add language about setting inspection schedules. Um, and, and then, re then reference the failed inspections up in, uh, yeah. you know, D, D1 or something, maybe. Mandy, I would like to, oh, go ahead before you. I'm going to go back up to D1 here. You can go, Pam. Um, I don't know how to tie this in, but but somewhere in there is probably either reference to nuisance house. If a nuisance house is something is a is a property that has achieved X number of violations, um, we've got it there. Okay. So yeah, this depends on what it takes to be designated a nuisance house, right? Okay. We um, haven't determined that yet. Right. Okay, what number is that? That is um, D2. D2, With so B1, D2. Got it, yep, that's what I wanted, it's there. And we picked three years on that one because of the standard three-year inspection time frame that's above. Any other comment? Oh, I had one more question for Rob, which is obviously we have to get onto an inspection schedule, Rob, if this passes, right? <laughs> right now, we given your department sort of three years, um, is that enough time or do you need four or five or what what kind of time do you need to get into every permitted property what do you think you need well i i like three years i think that's a good place to start and that's what we're going to base our you know the what we need to design the staffing to uh, you know to be able to uh, perform those inspections so I think that's that's a good starting point, and we'll see what the uh, you know where we go from there. Okay. So I'm going to unhighlight that then. Okay. Um, seeing no other comments on that one, we're going to move to the number of units inspected and inspection standards. Basically, I'm going with what's on the screen. Um, checklists we'll get to when we can put the whole thing on the screen. So the number of units didn't really change. It just got reworded. Um, there were three subsets to this before. It's exactly the same as those three, but reworded and combined into two. Um, <laughs> again, efficiency. Um, the first one is if you've got less than 25 dwelling units um, on a property, everything gets inspected for that um, inspection. Um, for um, anything with more than, for, for more than, well, so up to 25, 25 or less, so the wording could probably be, or um, it should be less than 25 or 25 or more is actually what it should be. Um, at that point, no less than 25 units, but at least 25%. So whichever of those numbers is greater. So between 25 and 100 dwelling units on a property, it'll be 25. Above 100, it'll be 25%. Um, and um, the, this, this gives the building the code enforcement officer has the discretion to say oh hey you know like 12 of your 25 units failed inspection for major reasons say we want to see another 12. you know it and and we didn't put into the regulations right now what those decision points are that's been entirely left up to the inspector to determine at what point are they comfortable with passing the building off and approving that inspection as good and at what point are they going to say we need to see more units this year instead of say next year um 
Pam. Um, on, I think, again, this is sort of a wording of a total of no less than 25 units, the last sentence here. It, it, it would be easier for me if it said uh, at least 25 units. Shall be I think it's 25%, at least 25% of the units shall be inspected. And I think it's 25%, not just 25 units. Um, no, so a minimum of 25 units shall be inspected. Well, what if it's a 400 unit thing? Are we talking? So not less than 25%. So 100 would be. So 100 would be inspected in a 400 unit building. Okay. Or property. So not less than 25%, but a minimum of 25 units. So a 50 okay. unit building or a 50 unit property gets 25 units, which is greater than 25%. Yep. But. Yep. I'm not sure where we came up with that number, but. Again, we could talk about that number. <laughs> I don't know what Rob, Rob, do you have a, you know, like in, in some of these larger buildings, what do you think is an appropriate percentage and where would you set these numbers if you set them uh probably right where you have them i, I you know i'm comfortable with that um there's not that many properties um we also have the option to um uh review inspection reports that are conducted by outside agencies uh for the larger complexes so i, I think there's enough flexibility there and i think that's that's a reasonable place to to be with those numbers. The standards um, came, all of this is directly from the bylaw. So we've seen this language before. I don't think any of this language changed. It just moved from, actually it was mostly in both. I think this is one we had it in both. <laughs> we, had, we had three pages of this listed in the regulations originally. Not this, no, the standards, not the checklist. The standards were in both there, and then, um, and then there's the checklist. So we'll move on to the checklist, which is where there were like four pages in the regulations. And what we've done here is basically say um, it needs to have that checklist needs to have sections on fire safety, electrical, building envelope, exits, plumbing, mechanical, and security. Um, based on the CMR. And then in addition, that checklist should have, should be able to confirm, so should have sections that could confirm compliance with the land use permit, and then things that were put into the application, submitted with the application, a management plan, a parking site plan, and then we added the sort of generic readily confirmable information in the permit application. So, you know, that can be massaged as we know what goes in the application, but basically um, the checklist should also say, everyone has to submit a parking management, a parking site plan. When the inspectors there doing the inspection, they should check off that the parking site plan is actually complied with at the property. Um, we've added submitting a management plan with the permit. And so they should make sure if there's things that are in that management plan that are readily confirmable, that should be confirmed when they're on site is sort of the thinking behind these. Rob. Could we say up in the, the, uh, the main, the introduction line that the inspection checklist at a minimum shall include the following? Yep. <laughs> Good. Anything else? Pam. Um, a question for Rob, and that is if we if we were to add either um, under E of inspection standards or here under inspection checklist um, that the, the chief 
um, inspection officer will update discrepancies on property cards based on inspection findings. I don't know that we ask anywhere for that to happen, I assume, because I know you're, you and your staff are probably doing that kind of thing, but is it worth putting in here that, that we get an updated um, file in some way or form? I, I like the intent of that. I don't know if I want it in the regulations. Um, you know, we don't have the ability, we don't have access to the property card system. It's, it's different. So what we do is um, share the information with the assessing department and it would be up to them to, you know, have the time, the staff availability to take that on. Um, I don't know how that will be handled with uh, implementing the program with so many, us doing so many inspections and gathering this information. So I guess I can't say we can commit to having the uh, assessor's property card updated in any time frame. Uh, but the goal would be to do that. Uh, you know, yeah. we have, we have a, a, a very interested uh, assessor that you know, is communicating very well with us on these types of issues and we're sharing what they find and what we find in the field and doing that every day. But uh, it'll be a big task when, we, when we're out there inspecting these uh, in the larger numbers. I think that goes to that earlier question is, you know, as we're asking for certain kinds of information, even if it's, you know, number of bedrooms and, and, um, and even sometimes number of units, I was hoping that information coming from this form would become a database or be part of another database that you could all use. So you wouldn't have to, you know, send copies of data to the assessor for then somebody else to sit there and update another file, which I think would be really onerous and not a good use of their time. Um, so. I'm looking for efficiencies if we if we can share this information. Yeah, I think we would love that too. You know, I, I'm not sure we'll ever, you know, in any um, foreseeable time, be on the same type of system with assessing. You know, they they have different categories that don't align with our land use descriptions. Uh, you know, building code considers something an apartment that they don't consider an apartment. They just, it's, it's seems to be a whole lot more complicated to get the idea of getting everybody on the same system. I'm not sure if that would ever happen. Uh, the best we can do is give them, give that right now, the best we can do with the systems we have is give them the, the, the newest uh, information that we have and ask them to, you know, reflect that in the latest property card. Wow. Okay. That's so. Good. You don't have access to the property cards. We I'm don't have access to that at all. We can't. We can't change anything in the property cards. Uh, it's a completely separate system from what we use for permitting, and always has been. So failed inspections. Moving on to that. This is the one of the ones that we moved here from the bylaw. So we've seen all of this language before. Um, so I'm going to move on to the energy efficiency standards, which we've discussed before. Um, these did not change from previous drafts and well, I'm not sure we've discussed them, but those, these are what the committee requested we put in here for the ener energy efficiency standards. So I think we've seen them before. I don't know what any... It, yeah, we've seen them before. They did not change from prior drafts or from what um, Steve Roof had sent a request from the committee to put in. Pam. Of all of the uh, ECAC um, requests for information, um, I think the, the one thing that I'm thoroughly comfortable with is is asking that a, a mass save audit be, be um, conducted and that that becomes something that at least raises awareness of 
the shortcomings of any of the units um, so that as time goes on, the town might be able to partner with with property owners to make some of the upgrades, you know, who knows how, where it would lead. But I I feel really comfortable asking for a mass save audit within the three years. So one thing I I I think I forgot to ask Steve when we did this: Does mass save do audits of large apartment buildings, or is it really only up to a certain number of units in a building? Um, because the one thing I worry about is this one is not that mass save audit. That one is free. That one is a means of scheduling something and then the owner being there. And we're giving them like four, three years to do that. And so sometime in those three years, you'll either have the place empty to hopefully be able to schedule one, you know, if, if tenants don't want, or you'll be able to work with the tenants to get it done. The one thing that worries me, and this is I've never looked at this portfolio manager, but this EPA portfolio manager, um, I don't know how complicated that is. I don't know how much knowledge of properties it requires. I know it is a free system. Steve told me that. Um, but I would worry that if it gets, if it is onerous, we might have problems. You know, or if it requires information that's just not readily available, like we might have problems. And so I think I want to talk to the committee about and maybe even see what this platform looks like, right? Like, could they get us a a printout of of what this thing, what information it requires a property owner to input? Um, cause then I think maybe I'd be more comfortable with it, but that's my worry. But right now I'm not willing to change it, but I, I think before I'd recommend to the committee that it get to the council that, that we put it in here, I'd, I'd want more information about it. So if there are no other questions on that, we can bring that when we bring Stephanie and um, Steve in, we can ask them those questions. Property management plan. This is a new addition um, into both the requirements for a com for obtaining a permit and um, obviously then in the regulations. It's not written yet. Um, but uh, when we sat down on Tuesday, Pam and I, we were thinking, you know, based on we had the food and drink establishment conditions in our heads um, as to things that were required to under that the the bylaw we've been looking at in food and drink and said well what of that should we require for obtaining this permit and we thought that well most rentals should have a management plan at least as part of their land use permit such that they already have one written well let's right. have it submitted with this application and then the part that's not written is if there's not a management plan in effect because it wasn't part of a use class of, you know, a use permit, mainly probably applies mostly to single family home rentals. Well, something should be submitted. And what we haven't written is what that includes yet. So that'll get filled in a little bit later um, as to the things. If Rob's got suggestions as to what we should, what should be required in that, we'd love to have them. You don't have to do that now, um, but that was the thinking of that if you're getting, if you're having a rental and you want a permit, well, you should have a management plan. And so we've added it into the bylaw and then this would explain what it needs to include if it's not something already passed by the ZBA or planning board or Rob for say ADUs. Jennifer. Yeah, I just had a question. Maybe I should probably know this, but is a management plan currently required for properties under a certain size? Rob? No, it, the, the management plan is only required when uh, when there's a site plan review or a special permit to, on a property. Um, but this would be a great place to deal with things like you know, guest policies and uh, trash and recycling. So uh, yeah, I'll be able to send you a list of things that we commonly look for in management plans uh, that we think should be there for this these types of properties. I think this is a great idea. So, and Pam. Yeah, I think in that, just on that first sentence, D1, I think it uh, 
to submit either of the following to meet requirements of the management plan. I think we copied and pasted parking site plan instead. The D1 should be management plan. Oh, <laughs> I missed it in one spot. <laughs> you can see where we got the language. <laughs> Oh, and this one, review the management plan. You can see where we pulled the language. Um, and uh, I was thinking about subdividable dwellings, which, you know, you can build up to three units, and there's definitely a management plan required under subdividable dwelling units. That would be similar, hopefully. Yeah. So I think if it's always, if it's generally required for site plan review and special permit, well, the most of the only things that don't have that, and I know we put it into the ADU accessory use management plans. Um, and so I, I believe we did, which means single family homes would probably be the only things that don't actually have a pre-existing management plan. So parking site plan requirements haven't changed. This was already here. And that brings us to the end of the regulations. Any other comments on the regulations themselves as currently written? Anything people think are missing? Um, want to add? Kelly. I was wondering if uh, Rob could clarify um, when uh, a management plan is currently required. So right, right now, a management plan is an application requirement. It's a submission requirement for any application for site plan review or special permit. Um, there are other instances in the bylaw uh, under administrative approval when site plan review is, uh, would, would be the permitting path, but there's an administrative approval uh, availability. You know, we'll ask for a management plan in order to make that decision. Uh, that's related to residential type properties. That's those are the those are the instances. Uh, there are there are many properties that are larger than single family that exist without special permits or site plan reviews in town that wouldn't necessarily have a management plan. So I think this you know will generate more management plans than just the single family homes. Thank you very much. I just wanted to make sure I had the notes accurate. Thank you. And for Rob's benefit, Kelly is our new minute taker. Yeah. <laughs> so, hello, nice to meet you. Day one, and we're throwing all these acronyms at her <laughs> that we're trying to clarify. Um, any other questions before we move on? On regulations only. I'm going to go back, if I could, to, yes. to the energy efficiency um, discussion. And given that Rob is now here when we talk about it, um, Rob, we were just saying, you know, what what information is captured? Would it be retrievable, reportable? Um, and and who who needs this kind of information as we as we look to more than fifty percent of our housing stock is is rental units. And if we're going to make any kind of strides in our in meeting climate action goals, we really we really, you know, have to start somewhere. And and does it make sense as part of a uh, a requirement for getting a, a permit to to rent to at least acknowledge that we could be making gains in energy efficiency? So our dilemma is. You know, is that something that belongs in a rental registration or, you know, regulation, or is it, um, is this a tool, is this the appropriate tool, and can we use the data? Rob? So, I mean, my opinion is that it, it's appropriate. So, you know, I think that these types of questions uh, well, historically, on any permit application, there's a series of questions about the property, about the building that are asked. Um, I think that that everything we have is so outdated, uh, you know, that we're moving towards asking questions like this. Uh, I think we'll we'll do so in other instances as well, as we update those 
those permit applications, you know, based on energy codes that are mandated, you know, so I think, I think we're moving in that direction. So if there's balancing that with uh, not making the application so lengthy that it's that time consuming to get through, um, you know, what, what information would be really valuable uh, that we're going to do something with or use in some way would be a good starting place. And it's really easy for us to, you know, have half a dozen questions related to energy efficiency and add to that over time if, if there's the desire to have new and inf different information collected. So I think, I think we should do it. Thank you, Thank you very much. Pat. Yeah, I'm, uh, apologies, but I'm going to need to leave the meeting. I am really not feeling well. Thank you for coming for the length of time you did, Pat, and I hope you feel better. Thank feel you. better. Yeah, take care. Um, so I had one question for Rob as it relates to this, you know, balancing that how long an application takes to fill out, you know, if we ask this information with this new permitting system or any application, I think you've mentioned, and I just want to confirm for a renewal, like if all of this is filled in for the first year, including something like gross square footage, which generally doesn't change year to year, right? Um, when they sign back in to quote, apply again, does their answers from the year before just pop up? And so that then they only have to go in and change what changed or do they have to re-input every single one of these every time such that they might have to look it up again every time? So if the system's working properly, they're only entering it once. Uh, and they're, they're essentially asked the question, has anything changed? Uh, you know, and provide the new information. So the, the, goal, the goal would be to have the renewal be much more efficient than the first, uh, first time around. Okay, that, that eases some of my concern then, <laughs> you know, it, including around, we, we were discussing it actually with, with, as it more relates to number of bedrooms and bathrooms in each dwelling unit and number of occupants in each dwelling unit and how that might look on an application. And, you know, the bedrooms and bathrooms doesn't change every year. And so you've got a Puffton or someplace that's got 300 units. If you have to enter that for each unit every year, that's very yeah. onerous, but. Yeah, we don't want them to do that, you know, and it's, it's similar to the parking plan. Once we receive a parking plan, they're asked the question, has anything changed in the parking plan? If not, you don't need to upload a new plan every single year with the renewal. Okay, great. Okay, any other questions related to regulations? Pam? No, but on that on that very topic, I was thinking about the form. I, I don't know, but I would hope that the, um, the application form is actually expandable text blocks so that if in fact they're listing five buildings with X number of bedrooms, et cetera, that it can be expanded as needed to add that information. Otherwise it's otherwise it's not data. I I think we can do that. I you know it's definitely something I want to check with Steve in my office, but I, I think we can break it down by you know building one, two, three, four, five and have that answer. Uh, I think right now we collect it just as a total number of bedrooms yeah. on the property associated with the card, uh, number of buildings and number of bedrooms. But I, I think we can break it down uh, by building and ask those questions. And, and, and while I'm at it, um, we talked about the attachment of a parking plan or a management plan do you see those attached as you know a PDF or something to the the primary application? Right, that's the easiest way for uh, the applicant to to get it into the into the system. Um, you know, in some cases, uh, attachments like that are emailed to us, and we're converting them to PDFs or. Uh, and, and getting them and attaching them uh, for them, but it, it can be done through the application process as a PDF. Great. Any other questions?
Seeing none, I'm going to stop this share. This will be cleaned up for the next meeting. Um, we are not at this point going to go on to the bylaw. I'm actually going to, we'll see what kind of time we have left after I do the next couple of things. We're going to move on and take general public comment right now. Um, and depending on how long that takes, I'm we're going to end this meeting on time. So depending on how long that takes, we'll decide whether we have time to go back to any or have a desire to go back to any of the bylaw or whether we just finish off our agenda and adjourn after that. And then so, the fee structure, we're not going to do this. We're week. not touching fee structure. Okay. I've, I've sent I, the list, the, the item in the packet for street free structure is what I requested Rob to provide some answers to or his department to. I gave him um, essentially to the first week in January with a goal of bringing it back at our first January meeting and, and said, Rob, if you needed more time, let us know. Um, but I knew it was unreasonable to ask that it be provided by this meeting. Um, so yeah, we're, but I put the document in so people could see what I forwarded okay. to, to Rob. So um, right now we're going to take public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of CRC. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. Um, and CRC in general does not engage in a dialogue or comment during public comment on matters raised during public comment. Um, so at this time, if you'd like to make public comment, please raise your hand and I will um, call on people as they are, and hopefully Athena's present to be able to do all the unmuting. <laughs> if not, we'll figure it out. Um, I'm here, so, I got you. Oh, excellent, thank you, Athena. <laughs> um, so Patrick Caymans, please unmute yourself, identify um, where you live or who you're speaking on behalf of, and then make your comment. Well, thank you, um, Patrick Caymans from Caymans Real Estate. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, Jennifer, said she was struggling to find um, the regulations and we were too. The regulations weren't actually up on the website until about 5.30 from when I looked. So it was really difficult for us to follow with you because I'm on my phone and trying to, I mean, I tried my best and listen. So I would like to offer that maybe so we could have the public have time to prepare for this meeting if we could address some of these things at the next meeting so that the public has time to actually have a chance to read um, the regulations as they weren't provided, you know, until just a few minutes ago. And I feel very unprepared to speak on many of these things, even though I'm listening to what you're saying and following along. Um, I find it difficult without actually, you know, seeing it all there and trying to follow along on my phone. Thank you. Thank you for that comment, Patrick. Um, this was not the only time we have regulations on. It, it will be on future agendas. Um, and I apologize for um, them not having been on, on, in online prior to the meeting. Um, I should have checked. Renata, please unmute yourself and make your statement and identify where you live and make your statement. Hi, uh, Renata Shepard, um, Justice Drive in Amherst. Um, I would, I don't know how possible this is, but. I would like to see um, the committee maybe do a mock registration, some kind of a role play, uh, thinking of where you live, if you own or whatever, and uh, put yourself in a landlord's shoes and go through this registration process with all the requirements and like pretend you're renting to a student or to a family that likes to party or go through those regulations and maybe go to each item and see how much you're going to spend in terms of time and fees um, and versus how much you spend for housing versus how much you're gonna be getting in rent. Um, and see how feasible all the little details are to get done or information to get acquired and input, input into the system. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Renata. 
Seeing no other hands, we are going to close public comment period right now. Um, as I said, I apologize for um, the documents not being online. Um, I should have checked to I should have checked to confirm that they were. Um, does uh, Athena? Yeah, I'll apologize for that, Mandy. You did send them to me, and I didn't send confirmation because I hadn't posted them. So that's oh. that's my <laughs> my fault. Sorry I thought I had that. confirmation, so, so that's, so that's on both you, of us. You then. did, but I, I didn't lie <laughs> because <laughs> I didn't do it. But I'm, I do apologize, especially to you, Mr. Crossman, or to Mr. Caymans, who uh, was looking for them at the meeting. Sorry about that. No. And, and I had not realized I hadn't gotten a confirmation that Athena is always so good about sending them to me when, when it is done. So um, errors around, and I'll take full responsibility for all of it because you know I'm chair. So um, we have minutes to do and announcements. Um, does the committee want to go back to bylaws for a brief five minutes or shall we just do minutes announcements and then end the meeting early? I, um, I think I'm getting some <coughs> let's end early. That's fine because some of us have another meeting after so. <laughs> I, I figured it might be nice to finally end early instead of five minutes late. Um, so with that, we have minutes of December 1st, 2022 to, um, to pass. Um, they are in the packet. Um, any comments on them? Pam. I don't recall seeing any issues and I would make a motion to approve as posted. Is there a second? Second. Jennifer seconds. Are we ready to vote on that? I'll start. I'm an I. Pam. I. And Jennifer. I. They are approved as presented. And what was the, excuse me, what was the date on them? Just for the December 1st minutes. Thank you. And for um, the record, that's, that's three to zero with two members absent. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yes. Two members absent. Um, Pat DeAngelis and Shalini Balmilne are absent. Um, and Pat, Pat for the note left around six o'clock. Yeah. Um, announcements are sort of the same as next agenda preview, but but there's a little bit of difference on some of them. So um, December 20th at 10 a.m. are ZBA interviews and recommendations. They will be on Zoom. Um, so that is this coming Tuesday at 10 a.m. Um, so that's half announcement, half next agenda preview. Those are the only things on the December 20th agenda is the interviews and then committee recommendations. Um, can I just ask again, when you think you'll, because I may, um, we're not having any more public forums on the bylaw, right? But we don't have any scheduled at this point. Um, we could try and schedule one now that we're getting closer to having sort of full discussion on everything, if that would be desirable. I can look at dates in late January, early February for sort of a public forum on, um, hopefully by then we'll have a draft nuisance bylaw too, <laughs> um, on sort of the, the whole package it it would probably good, be good to have a public forum on the whole package maybe before we vote a final one we won't have good drafts of probably fee structure or nuisance until the end of january in terms of timing um so we'd probably be looking early to mid february for something like that if the committee would want to have one and then we'd probably go back to the full council so the goal is to be at the full council. What what did I say? Um, the end of well, I think I said to the council, the end of January is extremely hopeful, but I don't expect it till the end of February no. at the earliest. Um, yeah, I, I the goal would be the end of February. Um, so I guess the goal would be the first March meeting for the council, right? First March. So, okay. So four more CRC regular meetings. Um, and maybe in that fourth one, I it's still very ambitious, right? Um, it's still a very ambitious timeline, it even is. with the amount of work we've accomplished today, right? I, I recognize it's still very ambitious, um, but that's that's the ambition in, in okay. doing it. You know, 
more logically, it it's coming to the council the April meeting, right? That's probably the more logical one is is the April meeting where we need March March's meetings too. Okay, that's better. I may miss the March meeting, so I wanted to be sure. Pam, um, nuisance house bylaw. Um, we chatted about mm -hmm. that coming to be discussed. I mean, that obviously has to get discussed here as well. And that target was um, second meeting in January. Is that correct? Um, um, let me let me take notes. So we had notes on a public forum in February. Um, I don't have my meeting schedule in front of me. So given what um, we got through um, a two hour, two hours at the first January meeting. Um, it's probably logical for the second for nuisance house. Um, um, because the first January meeting. Um, is hopefully the fee the fee schedule is one of the planned items. Um, it is the bylaw that we was in the packet today would be one of the other planned items. So the permit bylaw, um, and then the other planned item, which I have not, I have a request from Pam um, for having a guest in, hopefully at the first January meeting, and I haven't been able to respond to the email, Pam, but yes, so. Um, Pam had requested that we bring the assessor's office in to talk about how um, rental units and housing units, residential properties in general are assessed in terms of whether they, whether that assessment, part of that for this is could those changes or whatever those assessment methods are, do they have an impact on what we write for permitting? Um, and Pam had requested a, a brief conversation with the assessor's office on that. And so I hope to fit that into the January, the first meeting in January, the 12th, I think that meeting is. And so those three things together, I think will fill the first meeting. Um, yeah, easily. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and we have to get back to, um, so the second meeting would then be, the second meeting in January would then be the nuisance house bylaw, um, and the, the, um, engagement report. So I hope I have, we're having a meeting on January 5th and January 19th. No, we changed them with the new schedule, the 12th and the. Okay, I need to, yeah, I need to file my new appointment. I, I mentioned that when we passed the new schedule that we flipped the meetings for January that were yeah. on the old schedule. Um, so it's the 12th and the 19th. Um, and so the 12th, and so the 19th would then be engagement report and nuisance mm -hmm. house bylaw. Um, okay. And all, uh, Kelly, you have a question. My question, I just wanted to clarify uh, the public forum um, that you're discussing for February. Uh, what would the subject matter be? Oh, it would be on um, the residential rental bylaw. Great. Um, so that basically covers our agendas, um, depending on what else we're doing. Things might change a little bit, but we have those th five things plus um, Shalini had requested an update on implementation of comprehensive housing policy, sort of next steps on that, where, where things are going in the planning department for that. Um, so if we can fit that in in January, I will. If not, February might be more logical, given, especially given the, the vacancies that are in the planning department right now, pushing until, waiting until we have filled some of those vacancies if possible, might be more logical because we might get a better idea of what's actually capacity-wise doable in the department um, once there are less vacancies. Um, but that's also sort of on my radar as something that, that needs scheduled for agendas, future agendas. Any other future agenda requests um, at like all? Like to clear, I don't have, I don't again, don't have the uh, the meeting schedule in front of me, but I was looking at the twelfth and the twenty sixth as CRC meetings, 
um, what, what through the 19th? There is not one on the 19th, yeah. just the 12th. We might 26th. be going to MMA is. That was probably why I didn't right. like the 19th anymore. And I was like, oh, that's not a wise time to have a meeting. And so instead of. Yeah, that makes sense. Two in a row, one of those, I, I just moved them. That You're probably right as to why I was like, I don't like one then. Oh, good. Yeah. So 12 and 26. Okay. Any other agenda items? See none. I don't have anything unanticipated, which means we're adjourning the meeting at 621 p.m. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Athena. And I know Rob's already left, but thank you, Rob, too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Athena. Thank you. It was great to meet you all. Yeah. Thank you, Kelly. Bye-bye.